Shabbat Shalom. I'm Rabbi Daniel Brenner, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here to the Relic Studios, where we have a very special Friday night jams. So we are aware that this Friday night, we are coinciding with Christmas Eve, or as I like to call it, Arab Christmas. And uh, we just decided it's time to embrace it. And we are going to hear some incredible music that is in the Christmas album genre from Jose James. We're also going to have some wonderful music from Talia Billig. And uh, Jose is going to be accompanied by Christian Sands, who is just a phenomenal pianist. So that is all going to happen. But first, we want to pause take a breath, and welcome in the spirit of Shabbat. So to do that, we're going to turn to Talia to sing Shalom Aleichem, welcoming in the angels of peace, welcoming in the spirit of rest and renewal.
Thank you, Talia. And now we're going to start our Shabbat table conversation as we do on Friday Night Jams. And we're going to do that as if we were all together. So I'm going to make a kiddush over some wine, and we're going to break bread together, have a little challah. But first, a brief reflection on the Torah portion that we read this weekend. This weekend, we start Sefer Shmot, the book of Exodus. And it's a story in which a young boy, a baby, Moshe, Moses, is taken in by the daughter of Pharaoh and grows up in an incredible palace, but hears the suffering, the cries of his people. And in this chapter, in this Parsha, Moshe runs away and has an encounter in front of a burning bush. And this is an incredible spiritual and mystical moment in which Moshe asks to the Holy One, what is your name? Who shall I say she has sent me? And the answer is, Ehiyeh asher Ehiyeh. I will be what I will be. This is a teaching that conveys the idea that God, the Holy One, the Great Spirit, the Divine, appears in many forms in our lives. In many ways, many attributes, I will be what I will be. And this is the first time that that name is uttered. And it becomes not only a name, but a metaphor of idea about openness and change. So as we tonight celebrate and enjoy some incredible music from the Christmas songbook, we're also opening ourselves up to a time of change, allowing for the flow of the divine, allowing for the Holy One to enter into our lives and sanctify them as we gather together this holiday season. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, bore pri hagafen. And let us break bread together. You open up your hands and you satisfy the needs of every living soul. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. And now we're going to ask you to join us at our table for a conversation about Jose James' new Christmas album all part of Friday Night Jams. And we hope that in the future, you'll join us as we return to live Friday Night Jams um, and join us at an actual table so I'll have people that I can share this challah with. Merry Christmas, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Welcome to the Relics Studio. We are actually approaching almost our first year here, and it's a great way to end uh, the holiday season with uh, one of the best holiday albums that came out this year. And of course, uh, you know, the Christmas album is a very important part of every musician's discography. And it's just a matter of when and why they decide to do it. So my first question is, why was 2021 the year that you decided to not only um, do your take on some of these amazing classics, but of course, you know, add your own originals to the catalog? Mm. Well, congrats on one year. Yeah, almost. Yeah, almost. Hopefully we make it through the next Nearly. few weeks. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't know what, what Tali thinks, but for me, the fact that we've, we live in Amsterdam now, so the physical distance and the emotional distance from family has been a challenge in the last two years. And I think um, this year I decided, when usually every year we go to Minneapolis for Thanksgiving to see my family. I'm from Minneapolis. And when we realize, oh, we're not gonna be able to do that, I, I started to realize I wanted to express that sort of like loss and, and also the strength of the connection musically. 
And my grandmother, Nancy, who has passed away, my mom's mom, she introduced me to um, the music of Louis Armstrong and Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald. So there's a lot of ties to that, to that kind of Christmas sound and Christmas music. So it was kind of all that in one thing. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you guys are living in Amsterdam now. What, uh, what made that move happen? Hmm. You want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> what made that? The pandemic yeah. made, that, made that happen. Um, and I think we were ready for a change, but to be honest, um, we're both such New Yorkers that I think it took something that drastic that it was born out of necessity. Um, and so we were very fortunate in a time where it was very difficult for artists here to be given a home in Holland. And, you know, it's been very good. It's, it's, it's done beautifully for us. And it's been lovely to have the space that, again, allowed, I think, Jose to sing the way he sang with that love for our families, missing them. <laughs> Uh, you you moved me when you talked about just the the sense of missing family and 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 loss. I'm thinking a lot about um, 1941 when Irving Berlin was writing White Christmas and America was at war mm. and people were so far away from their families and families were split up and just thinking about the the desire to heal that those so many of those songs started out <laughs> um, trying to actualize. Um, can you say a little bit about your connection to the, those early Christmas songs and, and the, the feelings they're, they're evoking and, and what it was like as an artist to, to take that on? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, that's that there's a certain sentiment. And it, it always ends up being positive and joyful. Um, and I think, you know, as an adult, looking back on those songs, which, you know, I... I enjoyed them, you know, among other songs like Frosty the Snowman, <laughs> you know what I mean? Rudolph, okay. Yeah, you know. And, and when we sort of started looking at, let's make this Christmas album, let's go through the repertoire, how are we going to present this as a cohesive, emotional, musical thing? You hit the nail on the head exactly. It's like all of these songs have this kind of wrestling with the idea of, you know, what's memory, what is ritual, what is family? Is is the love still there? Can you still celebrate the holiday if you are apart? And, you know, I think there's this sort of like blanket idea of Christmas just sort of being this like get together and it's like this couple nights and, you know, you celebrate and don't talk about things, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's it's very different now, you know, and, and it kind of in a good way, I think for me. I was able to sort of re-examine um, things, even memories that were difficult for me at growing up. Mm-hmm. I could see the good things about them, you know, because my family didn't always get along, you know. <laughs> but Not, I, most don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you kind of realize the power of ritual to get everyone together mm-hmm. and to share a meal. It's also a, a bit more complex for me because my step grandmother is Jewish oh. <laughs> so I also I had two different Christmas celebrations um, and I actually we got I got to see her in Minneapolis mm-hmm. and kind of talk about Christmas with her over matzo ball soup <laughs> <laughs> and well the, that that is, seems like every home in Minneapolis for some reason I <laughs> yeah, think like yeah, yeah, something yeah, exactly, like exactly. <laughs> incredible yeah amazing so it was, it was just trying to channel all of that uh, into something that you know, because I feel like everyone's going through that, you mm-hmm. know, whether even if you're in the same city, you know, sometimes we're protecting our elders and not visiting as often or as much as we'd like. So I think there's a there's a degree of that separation this year for everyone. Mm. No, yeah, and I think that especially last year when everyone really was still locked down, there was a feeling of the, the weight and the importance of the holidays was was really magnified in a, mm. in a, in a way that probably um, it reminded uh, many of the of the times when a lot of these songs were actually written in a very unique way. And at the same time, you know, if you think about the, the contrast of the season, you know, we are trying to bring light into the darkest time of the year, which is the ultimate contrast in many ways. You know, I, you know looking at the actual recording of this album, I know you guys um, 
tried to recreate some very specific uh, recording environments to kind of mirror the time when some of these songs were originally tracked. Can you talk a little bit about the, the process of that and, and also some of the kind of the techniques you use to make it sound, uh, I guess, timeless in that way that some of these songs are? Absolutely. Um, well, it was really important to me to capture two distinct sounds on the record. Um, one was the, the pop sound of the 50s, which we tend to think of as jazz, but it was the pop sound then, you know, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, um, Judy Garland, you know. And I've been lucky enough to be in that studio at, at Capitol Records and use that microphone and kind of see and be in the environment and record in there. Um, when I did the Bill Withers album, we actually used Nat King Cole Steinway that he recorded the Christmas song on. So feeling that and that sense memory was a huge part of it. And at the same time, if you listen to those arrangements, you know, they're very 1950s pop arrangements, uh, which I love. But I wanted to bring the sort of black jazz, modern jazz sound mm -hmm. of like Miles Davis, of Dexter Gordon, and specifically for this album, um, Oliver Nelson, Blues and the Abstract Truth. That was really my idea. So, you know, all of those modern jazz records, um, and Time Out is also a great example of this LCR panning, where you hear the piano on one side, the drums on one side, the bass in the middle, and the horn in the middle. And I said, I really want to capture that, because that, to me, that's the real sound of jazz. Mm. So I was trying to, as a producer, you know, recreate the vocal sound of the, the, the Frank and Sinatra on top of the modern jazz thing. Mm -hmm. And I, it worked out, yeah. Thankfully. <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle. Right. <laughs> All right, let's focus on the Christmas miracle part. Uh, so uh, I was thinking just as, as a rabbi, like what, what is, what, how, do, how do we as the Jewish people read the Christmas story? We, we think about the messianic ideas. We think about this, this vision that the world is broken and maybe there is going to be a time when the world could be healed and fixed. Um, and we have these associations with a child that can be born, that can redeem us, that can, that can save us. Um, I'm just thinking about like that as the core uh, Christmas story that is the backdrop of what all these great Jewish songwriters were talking about a few mm -hmm. minutes ago were doing. But there is that um, epic story of hope that is there. Um, and I just wanted to ask if, if that was part of how you related to the music or, or how, you, how you connect to that, to that story and, and, and this music? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so my mom's family, they're Irish Catholic, and I went to a Catholic high school. Ironically, my grandmother, my Jewish grandmother, lives across the street from... Um, I, I love this. I can't wait for yeah. this to be in the movie. Yeah. You know, yeah. some scene when, you know, they're called, their kids are coming out and she's over there with her matzo balls. Okay. Totally. Yeah. Um, That's so okay. good. So, I mean, I guess it's, it's a roundabout answer, but um, I had a sense of memory being back in Minneapolis going to see my grandma. There's a church where that was associated with the Catholic high school, Catholic church, where I actually sang mass mm. for my teacher. And we, I, I was in the choir, and so I learned Vivaldi and all the classic church music. And it didn't really, like, resonate with me. You know, my mom was very, like, hands-off in terms of, like, religion and spirituality. She's like, they're all cool, you know, just she's a total hippie. So she's just like, <laughs> do whatever you want to do. Like, right. here's some books, figure it out. You know? Abstract truth. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was sort of always drawn more to the spiritual side of it um, and the grandeur of these rooms. Um, these cathedrals, you know, and when I sang, when so my Dennis Wadley, my English teacher, passed away during the school year, and then the choir sang at his mass, mm -hmm. and that moment really changed everything for me. You know, it it the power of the music. I had been rehearsing these songs, and they didn't have any meaning to me outside of I love the music but it was like uh, okay it's a cool song you know from a long time ago and to hear our voices in that room seeing someone I knew and, and cared for who's now passed on I realized wow my voice can help someone's 
I think spirit transition to a better place, or at least can sort of heal the community in a different way, different way. So that was a, something I brought into it. Um, and I never knew what that background was going to translate to. But I do think, you know, there is, there are many Christmases, you know, there's the sort of commercial pop Christmas and shopping and yeah. Rudolph and, and then there's the deeply devotional side. And I think what I tried to do on this record was land somewhere in the middle where it would be accessible um, for anybody, no matter what your faith or feeling about it. Uh, because for some people, Christmas is a very sad time, you know, where they feel like they're misunderstood or can't connect, you know. So I also wanted to make this record for those people. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's, I know it's a long answer, but I'm trying to give you a good <laughs> I think it also connects with the modern jazz piece because artists like John Coltrane and Eric Dolphy and Thelonious Monk were able to really kind of bring God into their music um, through without words. And that's powerful to me. So it's all kind of there together, hopefully, you know. You, you are in line with the mystics. <laughs> it's beautiful, <laughs> very beautiful. What, what, something you were saying actually reminds me of uh, a quote that uh, Reb Brenner said a few years ago when we were doing a similar talk with Delicate Steve about his uh, Christmas album, and that this is the one time a year that some of those uh, jazz greats and kind of the jazz catalog becomes pop music for a few weeks, and you hear it in right. stores, <laughs> and, and you hear it on the radio yeah, all yeah. the time. In fact, there, there's pop-up stations on satellite radio just to that for, the, for just these few weeks, which is must be amazing as an, as an artist who has you know, trafficked in that world for so mm. long that you know that every time at this time of year, you're going to be able to kind of hear that again. Jazz takeover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, we talked a lot about, obviously, uh, you know, family and about uh, distance and tradition. You know, when it came to kind of, you know, your original um, offerings for this record, you know, where on this spectrum of from, from pop to devotional did you try to land, you know, your, you know what you're going to add to the catalog here? Mm. And I guess working together, talk a little bit about how you guys teamed up on that. Mm. I don't know that we talked about it. We I think we just kind of wrote it. <laughs> yeah. I think we at this point we're we're very instinctive mm -hmm. and we sort of just let the song unfold. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, we didn't sit down and say let's write a Christmas song. And we wrote Christmas in New York, the one that I think is connecting with people the most years ago. And we were in Los Angeles staying at my uncle's house and he has a beautiful piano and Jose kind of came in and said I think this is a Christmas song. And that's like generally how we write things. And we finished it fairly quickly. And Jose likes to remind everyone that we did it very much in the style of how most Christmas songs are written in LA in the summer in a heat wave, actually. We wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we, I don't even think we thought you were going to sing it. Like we thought we would give it to somebody else. That's right. That's right. We were like, Michael Bublé should sing this. Yeah. <laughs> What's yeah. he doing this year? Yeah, for we'll Christmas? give it to Jamie Cullum yeah. or something. But, you know, I think, I, I don't know, I, unless I'm missing that, I don't remember writing either thinking too much that way. Although I remember we wrote Christmas Day in Amsterdam thinking very much about honoring that family and ritual. We did. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's kind of like an interesting discussion for me because my family is so varied uh -huh. and, and and different you know I have like a black family a white family a Jewish family an Irish Catholic family you know <laughs> like a Caribbean Afro-Caribbean Christian family and I've sort of like seen that as a strength you know like I, I'm taking the best of you know if, if my life is a compilation album it's the best of Jose James it's all these different <laughs> cultures you know so like um Christmas Day, it was, I mean, when I listen back to it now, I, I see it's very clearly a combination of, you know, sort of my my um, black culture with memories of Christmas with my grandma, my Jewish grandma, if you can think of it. But this isn't anything that we sort of talked about consciously. Um, and I, I certainly didn't grow up in the black church religiously but the music has had such a huge impact and all of my mentors in Minneapolis mm -hmm. were either from Detroit or Chicago who were very rooted in that tradition so they brought me that um, a kind of understanding of how it links to the music and I guess at this point um, I do you mentioned like the mystical kind of concept and and that's spot on you know I think it's 
that's sort of the power of music. It's, it is able to transcend religion and sort of like hit you here if it's a good song. So I think we just focused on it being a good song. Yeah. There, there was a controversial part of Christmas Day, though. There were two bridges. Oh, yes. One was sort of a more yes. traditional Christmas bridge. Turnaround. Yeah. And then we, I wrote this kind of more Stevie Wonder-ish, goes somewhere else. And I wasn't sure, you know, if we could put that on the album. And we went with the... Well, we pitched it to the band. Yeah. One person wanted the regular turnaround. No, no. Two people voted for the regular. And one person voted for There's the There's going to be one. a recount. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We ended up with the Stevie because that was honoring where you wanted it musically. And in the end, I think, as, as Potna, at some point you're like, what do you want to do? I mean, I think, and it honored sort of the like silver bells and the space that you wanted it in, which was that Stevie Wonder space. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's all on there. You know, it's, it's uh, can one album hold space for Stevie Wonder? and Donny Hathaway, and Frank Sinatra, and Nat King Cole, and Ella Fitzgerald, and Oliver Nelson, and Jay Dilla. That's true. And, we, and somehow we did, we did all that. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Uh, you know, you guys are, are, are both musicians. Uh, you, you mentioned you're both very much New Yorkers, you know, especially now that you guys are living away from your longtime home. Are there musical family traditions that you guys have adopted to kind of Connect, feel connected to performing together and mm. you know to your communities now that you're across the pond in a sense sort of we sort of have our like sit in our windowsill oh yeah yeah we perform in our in a little bay window that we have in holland in in amsterdam yeah yeah that was like the first thing we did when we moved to it's true yeah holland. it was in the winter because we have a fireplace just such an amsterdamian reality yeah like, we live in a two-bedroom in the middle of the city, and it has a fireplace. Also super Christmassy. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> totally. And so, <laughs> and so, and we got there, like, right around Christmas time, and Amsterdam in Christmas time is just magical. It's already, a, it's a very magical place. So, yeah, we have, like, a little fireplace, and we were, we were singing, we were immediately, the song Our House came to mind, because it's just, it, we're literally lighting the fire and yeah. placing the flowers. Kind of started as a joke, but then it was like, actually, this is a great this is, song. This is great. <laughs> Let's do it. And we filmed it. And it for fun. exploded. Yeah. People really loved it. But so we've started doing that where we kind of perform in the, in the window, you know, and, and I think Amsterdam, it's hard to say much about Amsterdam because we've been there in the lockdown for a year and may I say they are incredible at locking down. They, they really lock down. <laughs> yeah. So we haven't, you know, seen as much. So it's hard to say if we've, we haven't really had the opportunity, I think, to um, put down musical roots there. And so it's been more of us leaning on each other and, and creating together in a, in a quieter, more private space, which is new, you know, so we've both like learned a lot about production and, made new projects in that way but the forward facing part which i felt like was so much of our new york like like rockwood and you know all these mm. venues that are so dear to us that's been less so just in, by the nature of the lockdown mm. <laughs> yeah i feel like losing that community for so long you know even though it's now thankfully uh seems to be coming back to life did feel like some you not, i think i always realized how important it was yeah. but when it was removed it was hard to put into words why there was such a, a such a sense of loss just knowing that you're going to go into a room and see people that you've been had so many shared experiences mm -hmm. with is something that you know people outside you know the arts or maybe sports or some other fields probably don't experience very often yeah a hundred percent and to some extent i'm grateful like that streaming very much didn't work <laughs> like in terms of like live music i'm like i love this is wonderful <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that, you know, that we, that concerts are still going to be back probably alongside streaming, you know, because, well, you're right, like, I miss, there's nothing to replace that community, exactly as, as you said it. I hope I didn't say anything too offensive about streaming. No, I know what you mean. It's, it's the experience of sharing music and culture and community with other people. In yeah. The room. There's something indescribably wonderful about it. Yeah. And so, like, you know, to, be, to, to add on to that, we found the benefit of being able to reach people that could never really have seen us, you know. There are just certain markets we're not going to get to for a while, so it's been really cool to do those kinds of things. And also with the 
deep hope that those spaces come back and eventually we'll find our place there in Amsterdam. But we, you know, Rockwood is pretty, or, you know, the New York spaces are pretty unique in that way. I don't know that, as you said, I don't know that I realized until we were away from them how sacred they are for me. Hmm. That being said, we did perform at Paradiso together, which is a, an incredible venue yeah. where everyone from you know D'Angelo to classical people perform, and it's a former church. Church, yeah. That just now feels oh, like a, a sacred hall of Hallowed music. Hallowed ground, yeah. That was our last show in Europe, and that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I mean, like there's Antien Belgique in Belgium. There are really beautiful spaces. So you're right. We're learning. You're right. <laughs> yeah. We're figuring it out. Yeah, no, yeah. I I think that one of the reasons we started this series was the idea that music venues are sacred spaces and places where people commune, which is yeah. very similar to uh, traditional religion and spirituality. So there's a lot of commonalities in the way people gather in that way. Uh, you know, I guess shifting past the the Christmas album for a bit. You know, in my household at least, after we get through the holidays, there's of course award season, which is a nice way to gather and watch uh, and celebrate and uh, in a different way, which mm -hmm. is a great use of, of TV and streaming as well. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I know that we have some some Grammy nominees in in your touring party here. Ah. So if you could talk a little bit about the projects that are, are getting some well uh, well earned recognition this year. Ah, oh, thanks. Well, my I I was I was thank you for mentioning I was nominated for a Grammy and it was fabulous, um, yeah. So that was for working in it was I'm really proud of it, um, because it was with my best friend Rebecca Stevens. So it felt speaking to community and just people that we like long for and miss. It happened like in the middle of pandemic times, and it was probably I would say like one of the lowest points of my life would have been that morning. Mm -hmm. And we were watching, um, we watched the Grammys live because you were on the, you had just become a governor. Yeah, in the New York chapter. Yeah. So we were like, let's watch the Grammys. And um, I was certain that uh, Ben Williams, our artist, would be in the nominees. So I was like, let's watch because I'm excited for him. And there was just no, I didn't know I would, my name was in there. There was no universe in which I expected it. Um, and again, like we were, we didn't have our visas for Holland. We were living with my parents. We were like watching on their TV, and it came up. I think it was like Janae Iko who said, "I." It, it was, was yeah, <laughs> super cool. Yeah, <laughs> weird moment, and she named them and she said it, and I very quietly I said, "Wait, that's my name," <laughs> and like that's how it went. Like it was just like complete stunned, and then I kind of yelled the same sentence. Because I looked, like, my, my brain really was just like, what? <laughs> and that, that is 100% how it went. Like, Becca wasn't even, didn't even know. Same thing. I texted Becca to be like, hey, we just got nominated for a Grammy. And she didn't know either. Mm -hmm. So we called each other in, in, in ecstatic happiness. And I went down and I baked a celebratory pie and brought it down to Brooklyn to eat on the stoop. <laughs> And it, it felt so beautiful, you know, speaking about Rockwood, like Becca got me my first show at Rockwood Music Hall. She's like the reason I write songs. And when I came back from L.A. and I had moved back from L.A. and it was this kind of a similar sort of rough spot and I wasn't sure if anything made any sense. And she was having trouble with this album and called me to help write this song. And that's it just felt really cool because it came out of a terrible, like a horrible thing that happened to her. So it was really amazing to have this song that sort of transcended it be the one that got nominated and then we also have Christian Sands later who's going to be playing piano and has many very well deserved nominations of his own so it feels good you know you those are the things I know it probably sounds so silly but it um it may have been numbered in the best moments of my life <laughs> No one watching thinks that silly. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. not something that, you know, it, it's, it's a, it feels after, you know, 10 grueling years of putting time in, often in sort of sexist and difficult spaces, it felt really good to just have something that just is, no one can debate, and it just stays with you for life. If I do nothing else from today till forever, I'm still going to be Grammy nominated, right. <laughs> and I'm grateful. And another one of those moments where the, the highs and the lows were just right up against each other. Oh, like my we God. we talked about earlier. Yeah, mm. yeah, just, you know, you hear, and you have one as well, like, in the, Jose has this moment where, you know, you had, like, lost the jazz competition, and that's how you got discovered. He gave his CD in, in London, and they feel 
you you think it's not going to happen, and then it very much happened to me. Like I truly mean it. I think that was probably one of the worst mornings in my life, you know. And so it it felt it was much much needed after that year, and I think it sort of allowed me to have a confidence that I need in a in a space that's often plagued by imposter syndrome. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Just sort of lean back on that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I am really excited to hear your music. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. And we will uh, hear some of these great selections live. <laughs> Happy holidays, everyone. I'm Jose James, and I'm here in New York with my songwriting and life partner, Talia Billick. And this is a song we wrote together called Christmas in New York. One, two. Christmas time is coming through the air Trees and lights and presents meant to share A gift is almost anything It's the joy that love can bring It's the smile on faces everywhere Let's light up the windows after dark Build a funny snowman in the park And hear the children caroling Making magic as they sing All I want for Christmas is your heart wrote that last line. I did, thank All you. I want for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, which is a classic, classic line. I I'm pretty it. proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was in like a, a heat wave in LA we wrote it. Like all good Christmas songs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know, it feels, it feels solid to have it. I think so. <laughs> well, I think we should hear from you, from, from the songwriter as well. the joy that love can bring It's the smile on faces everywhere Let's light up the windows after dark Build a funny snowman in the park And hear the children Making magic as they sing All I want for Christmas All I want for Christmas All I want for Christmas Is your Happy Holidays. And now we'd like to bring up to the stage the incredible, incomparable mm. Christian Sands. Movie magic, movie magic, movie magic, movie magic, movie magic, movie magic. Fade to black, fade in, fade out. Oh, sorry. I got you. 
Oh, should we do? We should do yours now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it may not be 15 minutes. I feel like you should do yours. What time is it? 322. It's fine. Okay. You're doing three songs, right? Yes. Let me move that. This is Tali's, right? Uh, Christmas, the Christmas song, right? Yeah. We still rolling? Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost napping at your nose. Yuletide carols being sung by your choir. Dressed up like Eskimos Everybody knows A turkey and some mistletoe Help to make a season bright Tiny tiny with their eyes all aglow will find it hard to sleep tonight they know that Santa's on his way he's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh and every mother's child is gonna spy to see if reindeer really know how to fly. And so I offer you this simple frame. Kids from one to ninety two. Although it's been said many times, many ways, Merry Christmas to you.
idea. I could hear the snowfall on that one. <laughs> uh, should we do, what was it? I got my left skin one? Yeah. Christian Sands on the piano. This one is called, I've Got My Love to Keep Me Warm. The snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, I will weather the storm. What do I care how much it may storm? Yes, I've got my love to keep me warm. I can't remember a worse December. Just watch those icicles form. What do I care if icicles form? I've got my love to keep me warm. Off with my overcoat, off with my gloves. Who needs an overcoat? I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire, the flame gets higher, I will weather the storm. What do I care, how much it may storm, I've got my love to keep me warm. It may stone, yes. I've got my love to keep. I've got my love to keep. I've got my love to keep me warm. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. You look great, by the way. This is very like Marvin Gaye live at the North Pole. I love it. <laughs> exactly. It's it's you nailed it. Absolutely. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, we're going to do one more. This is one that I wrote with Talia called Christmas Day. And I feel like Marvin is is an appropriate reference for this one. Yeah. Yeah. falling all through the night welcoming the joy that Christmas brings oh and how my heart sings when we meet again on Christmas Day yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 
me to end on on Christmas Day. Hang the stockings, light up the tree. Every girl and boy waited for this day. And we know come what may, we will be. Glory days are here. And with your love, I'll last throughout the year, yeah. Until I see your face, I'll hear your voice, yes. Your laughter, joy, and grace that help me find my way to Christmas every day. Round the table, memories are shared. <laughs> Laughter to enjoy. And this Christmas cheer, lasting all through the year until we meet again on Christmas Day. Yeah, 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 we'll meet again on Christmas Day. When it gets cold outside, we'll meet again on Christmas Day. Yes, we'll meet again on Christmas Day.